Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain Chapter 3B What's that, he says, sort of pettish. Tain't nothing but an old empty barrel. An empty barrel, says I. Why, says I, spy glass is a fool to your eyes. How can you tell it's an empty barrel? He says, I don't know. I reckon it ain't a barrel, but I thought it might be, says he. Yes, I says, so it might be, and it might be anything else, too. A body can't tell nothing about it such a distance as that, I says. We had nothing else to do, so we kept on watching it. By and by, I says, Why, well, looky here, Dick Albright, that things are gaining on us, I believe. He never said nothing. The thing gained and gained, and I judged it must be a dog that was about tired out. Well, we swung down into the crossing, and the thing floated across the bright streak of the moonshine, and by George, it was barrel, I says I. Dick Albright, what made you think that thing was a barrel when it was half a mile off, says I, says he. I don't know. Says I, you tell me, Dick Albright. He says, well, I knowed it was a barrel. I've seen it before. Lots have seen it. They says it's a haunted barrel. I called the rest of the watch, and they come and stood there, and I told them what Dick said. It floated right along abreast now and didn't gain any more. It was about twenty foot off. Some was for having it aboard, but the rest didn't want to. Dick Albright said rafts that had fooled with it had got bad luck by it. The captain of the watch said he didn't believe in it. He said he reckoned the barrel gained on us because it was in a little better current than what we was. He said it would leave by and by. So then we went to talking about other things, and we had a song, and then a breakdown, and after that the captain of the watch called for another song. But it was clouding up now, and the barrel stuck right there in the same place, and the song didn't seem to have much warm-up to it somehow. And so they didn't finish it, and there weren't any cheers, but it sort of dropped flat, and nobody said anything for a minute. Then everybody tried to talk at once, and one chap got off a joke, but it weren't no use. They didn't laugh, and even the chap that made the joke didn't laugh at it, which ain't usual. We all just settled down glum and watched the barrel and was uneasy and uncomfortable. Well, sir, it shut down black and still, and then the wind began to moan around, and next the lightning began to play and the thunder to grumble. And pretty soon there was a regular storm, and in the middle of it a man that was running half stumbled and fell and sprained his ankle so that he had to lay up. This made the boys shake their heads. And every time the lightning come, there was that barrel with the blue lights swinking around it. We was always on the lookout for it. But by and by, towards dawn, she was gone. When the day come, we couldn't see her anywhere, and we wasn't sorry, neither. But just next night, about half past nine, when there was songs and hijinks going on, here she comes again and took her old roost on the starboard side. There weren't no more hijinks. Everybody got solemn. Nobody talked. You couldn't get anybody to do anything but sit around moody and look at the barrel. It begun to cloud up again. When the watch changed, the off watch stayed up instead of turning in. The storm ripped and roared around all night, and in the middle of it, another man tripped and sprained his ankle and had to knock off. The bear left towards day, and nobody see it go. Everybody was sober and down in the mouth all day. I don't mean the kind of sober that comes of leaving liquor alone. Not that. They was quiet, but they all drunk more than usual. Not together, but each man sidled off and took it private by himself. After dark, the off watch didn't turn in. Nobody sung, nobody talked. The boys didn't scatter around either. They sort of huddled together for it, and for two hours they sat there, perfectly still, looking steady in the one direction, and heaving a sigh once in a while. And then here comes the barrel again. She took up her old place. She stayed there all night. Nobody turned in. 
The storm come on again after midnight. It got awful dark. The rain poured down hail, too. The thunder boomed and roared and bellowed. The wind blowed a hurricane, and the lightning spread over everything in big sheets of glare and showed the whole raft as plain as day. And the river lashed up wide as milk as far as you could see for miles. And there was that barrel jiggering along, same as ever. The captain ordered to watch the man after sweeps for a crossing, and nobody would go. No more sprained ankles for them, they said. They wouldn't even walk aft. Well, then, just then, the sky split wide open with the crash, and the lightning killed two men of the afterwatch and crippled two more. Crippled them how, says you? Why? Sprained their ankles. The bear left in the dark betwixt lightnings towards dawn. Well, not a body eat a bite at breakfast that morning. After that, the men loofed around in twos and threes and talked low together. But none of them herded with Dick Albright. They all give him the cold shake. If he come around where any of the men was, they split up and sidled away. They wouldn't man the sweeps with him. The captain had all the skiffs hauled up on the raft alongside of his wigwam and wouldn't let the dead men he took ashore to be planted. He didn't believe a man that got ashore would come back, and he was right. After night come, you could see pretty plain that there was going to be trouble if that barrel came again. There was such a muttering going on. A good many wanted to kill Dick Albright because he'd seen the barrel on other trips and that had an ugly look. Some wanted to put him ashore. Some said, let's all go ashore in a pile if the barrel comes again. This kind of whispers was still going on, the men being bunched together forward, watching for the barrel, when, lo and behold you, here she comes again. Down she comes, slow and steady, and settles into her old tracks. You could have heard a pin drop. Then up comes the captain and says, Boys, don't be a pack of children and fools. I don't want this barrel to be dogging us all the way to Orleans, and you don't. Well, then, how's the best way to stop it? Burn it up. That's the way I'm going to fetch it aboard, he says. And before anybody could say a word, in he went. He swam to it, and as he come pushing it to the raft, the men spread to one side. But the old man got it aboard and busted in the head, and there was a baby in it. Yes, sir, a stark naked baby. It was Dick Albright's baby. He owned up and said so. Yes, he says, and leaning over it, yes, it is my own lamented darling, my poor lost Charles William Albright deceased, says he, for he could curl his tongue around the bulliest words in the language when he was a mind to, and lay them before you without a gent started anywheres. Yes, he said he used to live up at the head of this band, and one night he choked this child, which was crying out intended to kill it, which was probably a lie. And then he was scared and buried it in a barrel before his wife got home, and off he went and struck the northern trail and went to Rafton. And this was the third year that the barrel had chased him. He said the bad luck always begun, lied, and lasted till four men was killed. And then the barrel didn't come any more after that. He said if the men would stand it one more night, and was it going on like that, but the men had got enough. They started to get out a boat to take him ashore and lynch him. But he grabbed the little child all of a sudden and jumped overboard with it, hugged up to his breast and shedding tears, and we never see him again in this life, poor old suffering soul, nor Charles William neither. Who was shedding tears, says Bob. Was it Albright or the baby? Why, well, Albright, of course, didn't I tell you the baby was dead? Been dead three years. How could it cry? Well, never mind how it could cry. How could it keep all that time, says Davy? You answer me that. I don't know how it done it, says Ed. It done it, though. That's all I know about it. Say, what did they do with that barrel, says the child of calamity? Why, they hove it overboard, and it sunk like a chunk of lead. Ed, what? Did the child look like it was choked, says one? Did it have its hair parted, says another? What was the brand on that barrel, Eddie, says a fellow they called Bill. Have you got the papers for them statistics, Edmund, says Jimmy. 
Say, Edwin, was you one of the men that was killed by the lightning, says Davy. Him? Oh, no, he was both of them, says Bob. Then they all ha ha. Say, Edward, don't you reckon you'd better take a pill? You look bad. Don't you feel pale, says the child of calamity. Oh, come now, Eddie, says Jimmy. Show up. You must have kept a part of that barrel to prove the thing by. Show us the bunghole, do, and we'll all believe you. Say, boys, says Bill, let's divide it up. There's 13 of us. I can swallow a thirteenth of the yarn if you can worry down the rest. Ed got up mad and said they could all go to some place which he ripped out pretty savage and then walked off aft cussing to himself and they yelling and jeering at him and roaring and laughing so you could hear them a mile. Boys, we'll split a watermelon on that, says the child of calamity. And he come rummaging around in the dark amongst the shingle bundles where I was and put his eye on me. I was warm and soft and naked, so he says, ouch, and jumped back. Fetch a lantern or a chunk of fire here, boys. There's a snake here as big as a cow. So they run there with a lantern and crowded up and looked in on me. Come out of that, you beggar, says one. Who are you, says another. What are you after here? Speak up prompt or overboard you go. Snake him out, boys. Snatch him out by the heels. I began to beg and crept out amongst them, trembling. They looked me over, wondering, and the child of calamity says, A cussed thief. Lend a hand and let's heave him overboard. No, says Big Bob. Let's get out the paint pot and paint him a sky blue all over from head to heel and then heave him over. Good, that's it. Go for the paint, Jimmy. When the paint come and Bob took the brush and was just going to begin, the others laughing and rubbing their hands, I begun to cry, and that sort of worked on David, and he says, Bass there, he's nothing but a cub. I'll paint the man that touches him. So I looked around on them, and some of them grumbled and growled, and Bob put down the paint, and the others didn't take it up. Come here to the fire, and let's see what you're up to here, says Davy. Now, Sit down there and give an account of yourself. How long have you been aboard here? Not over a quarter of a minute, sir, says I. How did you get dry so quick? I don't know, sir. I'm always that way, mostly. Oh, you are, are you? What's your name? I weren't going to tell him my name. I didn't know what to say, so I just says, Charles William Albright, sir. Then they roared, the whole crowd, and I was mighty glad I said that, because maybe laughing would get them in a better humor. When they got done laughing, Davy says, It won't hardly do, Charles William. You couldn't have grown this much in five years, and you was a baby when you come out of the barrel, you know, and dead at that. Come now, tell a straight story, and nobody will hurt you, if you ain't up to anything wrong. What is your name? Alec Hopkins, sir. Alec James Hopkins. Well, Alec, where did you come from here? From a trading scout. She lays up the bend yonder. I was born on her. Pap has traded up and down here all his life, and he told me to swim off here because when you went by, he said he would like to get some of you to speak to a Mr. Jonas Turner in Cairo and tell him, oh, come. Yes, sir, it's as true as the world, Pap. He says, oh, your grandmother. They all laughed, and I tried again to talk, but they broke in on me and stopped me. Now, looky here, says Davy. You're scared, and so you talk wild. Honest now. Do you live in a scow, or is it a lie? Yes, sir, in a trading scow. She lays up at the head of the bend, but I weren't born in her. It's our first trip. Now you're talking. What did you come aboard here for? To steal? No, sir, I didn't. It was only to get a ride on the raft. All boys does that. Well, I know that, but what did you hide for? Sometimes they drive the boys off. So they do. They might steal. Look here. If we let you off this time, will you keep out of these kind of scrapes hereafter? Indeed I will, boss. You try me. All right, then. You ain't but a little ways from shore. Overboard with you, and don't you make a fool of yourself another time this way. Blasted boys, some raftsmen would rawhide you till you were black and blue. I didn't wait to kiss goodbye, but went overboard and broke for shore. 
when Jim come along by and by, the big raft was away out of sight around the point. I swam out and got aboard and was mighty glad to see home again. The boy did not get the information he was after, but his adventure has furnished a glimpse of the departed raftsmen and keelboatmen which I desire to offer in this place. I now come to a phase of the Mississippi River life of the flush times of steamboating, which seems to me to warrant full examination. The marvelous science of piloting as displayed there. I believe there has been nothing like it elsewhere in the world. 